there's a lot been going on in the electric vehicle world these days, and I haven't talked to Sam Abel Samid, the EV analyst for Guidehouse Insights for a while, so I thought I'd catch up with him and, and see where things are at in the industry these days. So welcome to the interview, Sam. It's good to be back with you again, Markham. Well, look, um, thanks for doing this. Uh, where are things at in the industry? We've heard of microchip uh, shortages and supply chain disruptions. Is the industry going to be able to meet its targets this year? Probably not. Um, well, let me re rephrase that. Probably not the targets they would have liked to have met, you know, back in, let's say, 2020. Um, you know, uh, undoubtedly, you know, everybody has revised their targets, you know, in, you know, month by month uh, based on what's going on. Uh, but yeah, we, we certainly won't be back to where we were in 2019. And, and I don't think we'll be getting um, nearly the number of vehicles that uh, manufacturers would like to build, certainly not as many as there's demand, there seems to be demand for right now. Now, that's another interesting question, because I remember just a few years ago, uh, reading a survey where, you know, the typical electric vehicle buyer was a, a professional high income couple with kind of a, you know, a green worldview. And mm -hmm. in just the space of maybe three years, uh, it seems now that all of that's uh, changed. And, you know, electric vehicles are now have really hit the mainstream. Is that a fair thing to say? They're getting to the mainstream. I wouldn't necessarily say they've hit the mainstream just yet, uh, but they're 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 getting much closer. Uh, you know, you still can't really buy, uh, you know, afford you know what I would term you know really affordable EVs just yet. At least not new ones. Uh, you can certainly get used ones at at fairly reasonable prices, uh, but you know the. the whatever the uh, equivalent is, you know, in, in the Canadian market, you know, here in the U.S. You know, getting a new EV in the twenty-five to thirty thousand dollar price range, you know, that's not something you're going to get right now uh, from anybody. Um, that's coming. You know, uh, GM uh, announced that they're going to launch uh, an electric version of the Equinox uh, in fall of 2023 with a price tag, a U.S. price tag, starting at thirty thousand um, dollars, and that's without any incentives. Uh, so, you know, we're we're going to we're getting there. And we're also starting to get um, EVs in market segments that are some of the best selling segments, uh, particularly big pickup trucks. Uh, Ford uh, is going to be kicking off full volume production of the F-150 Lightning in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we've seen over the past week or so, a lot of people posting screen grabs of their, their notifications that they got that their, their Lightnings have a build date, you know, and, you know, we're seeing build dates in the first week or two of April. So, you know, I think in the in the next two to three weeks, uh, we'll start seeing production lightnings coming off the line. Uh, next year, we'll have uh, the Chevy Silverado EV and 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 uh, uh, many others coming over the next couple of years. What about automated driving? Uh, you and I have talked about autonomous driving. You know, when autonomous driving is going to arrive, and and where we're at in the various levels uh, between one and five. Um, but I understand now that Tesla is auto test. Uh, Tesla is testing its autopilot in Canada. BMW is coming out with and and testing some of the the uh, automated driving. Uh, where are we at? Um, I, I would say that uh, if you're a driver in Canada uh, and you see a Tesla on the road, uh, beware, you know, stay, stay clear of it, um, especially, you know, because you don't know if it's running and it's with its full self-driving beta, which is not, not full self-driving. Um, it's, you know, it's still a supervised driving assistant system and it's nowhere near ready for true production yet. It should not be in the hands of consumers. Um, you know, nope, there are no there are no consumer vehicles that you can buy that are even close to being, you know, what we would talk, call autonomous or fully automated. Um, that's still quite a few years away from, from availability. Um, but we are starting to see more pilots of uh, automated vehicles um, in a variety of applications, robo taxi type applications. Um, <clears throat> recently, uh, both Cruise and Waymo got permits uh, from the California Public Utilities Commission to start charging for rides in the San Francisco area. Um, Waymo's already been doing that in Arizona for a couple of years now. Um, Motional has been doing it in Las Vegas with Lyft for several years. Um, 
uh, Argo is starting to do rides uh, in Miami and in Austin, Texas. Um, and we're going to see more and more of that over the next couple of years. Uh, also uh, seeing trucking, automated trucking, uh, starting to get a foothold. Uh, you know, we've seen some driver out tests uh, from Too Simple. Uh, we're going to see more of that. And again, still a couple of years from starting to get to, to scale, uh, you know, any sort of scale with that. But um, most of that um, is happening across the southern U.S., you know, where the weather is nice and sunny and it doesn't rain or snow very often. Um, you know, in Canada, you're, you're, it's probably going to be a while before you see uh, much of that, you know, except in, in very small pilot programs. Well, the, the next thing I want to talk to you about is bi-directional charging. Uh, this idea has been around for a while. Uh, there have been all kinds of... of um, uh, technical issues uh, with implementing it. Where are we at with bi-directional charging? Yeah, this is something that is actually really starting to take take hold. Um, you know, if you go back a, a decade or so, you know, 12, 13 years, when the, the modern age of EVs was, was really starting to emerge, um, one of the things that a lot of people were really excited about was this idea of vehicle-to-grid integration. You know, taking an EV use and plugged in and being able to, um, aggregate all these EVs and use those batteries um, to feed some energy back into the grid, you know, and provide some grid balancing, some grid backup, you know, during peak periods of demand. Uh, that part of it is still, we're not there yet um, because the, the challenge of feeding energy back into the grid from individual users is managing all of that is still really, really complicated. But what we are seeing is the first step towards that which is, uh, you can call it vehicle to home, uh, using bi-directional charging for vehicle to home capabilities. Um, and Ford in the F-150 Lightning has this capability. Uh, they call it their um, intelligent power backup system where you have um, an intelligent, a smart inverter in your garage when your truck is plugged in. Uh, if it detects a power outage, there's a transfer switch, it automatically switches off, you know, switches away from the grid for, to, from, your, from your house and um, starts drawing power from the battery in your truck to power your house, power it for several days if your battery is fully charged. Um, what we saw uh, last week, I think, yeah, I think it was last week, uh, General Motors announced a partnership with PG&E, which is the utility that covers most of Northern California, uh, to do a, a pilot um, that takes that idea uh, and uh, brings it up one layer and adds in what you call demand response, uh, which is the, the Ford system that you can buy with the F-150 Lightning now is managed completely locally at your home. So when it detects a power outage, it'll switch over to drawing power from your battery. When the power comes back, it'll automatically stop doing that, switch, put the, flip the transfer switch over, take it back from the grid again. What PG&E is going to test uh, with GM and also with Ford is uh, having the, that uh, transfer switch being remotely managed by PG&E. So when they're experiencing periods of very high load, uh, they can, and this is with opt-in of the customers, they can automatically switch, you know, flip those switches at people's homes, take them off the grid and reduce the load on the grid, let those homes be powered temporarily by the batteries in the vehicles, and then um, when, when things settle down, then they can switch it back and start charging those vehicles again. Um, so that's, that's the sort of thing we're gonna see. And we've seen other manufacturers make announcements of bi-directional charging capability. Lucid Motors has it in the air, their new EV. Volkswagen just uh, revealed the production version of the ID Buzz electric minivan that's, that's finally coming. Um, it's gonna have vehicle to home capability. Um, and, uh, and, and I think we'll be seeing this from more and more manufacturers going forward. Well, I came across a, uh, a term the other day that I, I'd never seen before, that software-defined vehicles, and I get, uh, gather that's uh, uh, when you've got hardware that's run by software, then it can do all sorts of things, uh, basically, depending on the limits of your software. Have I got that right? And what does that mean in, uh, you know, in real life with an electric vehicle? Yeah, so the, the idea of the software-defined vehicle is, you know, traditionally, a uh, vehicle comes off the assembly line, goes, you know, goes to the dealer and the customer, and the features that are on there are what is what you have on that vehicle for the life of that vehicle. So, for example, if you get a car that's got heated seats um, or power windows, 
those are the features that you're going to have as long as they continue to work, as long as that vehicle is functional. Now what we're doing is we're seeing manufacturers start to build in hardware and, you know, it, it, the software is obviously a limitation, but so is the hardware. Obviously the software cannot create features where the hardware doesn't, can't support it, but they're building hardware into vehicles. And this is something that Tesla started. Um, and, you know, autopilot is a great example of this, uh, where they build in the sensors for their autopilot system and, and their, their so-called full self-driving. Uh, and then you can add the software later to enable those features. Um, we've seen other manufacturers talk about, uh, you know, having subscriptions to certain features. So, for example, you can have heated seat hardware built into the car, but if you only need that three or four months out of the year, you can, when it gets cold, you can subscribe, you know, for a couple of dollars a month and have heated seats enabled. And then in the springtime, you can cancel your subscription, just like you might do with your streaming service. Um, and over, over the life of the car, you can add features as needed or as software, as new software is developed. It also uh, includes things, you know, over the air updates uh, to add, add certain capabilities or fix problems with the car. Um, so it's not limited to just what was there when it was built, but it, it, you have the capability to use software to create new functionality that, that wasn't there when it was, when the vehicle was purchased. Interesting. Uh, well, speaking of banning uh, uh, over-the-air updates, West Virginia is thinking of banning over-the-air updates. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so this is this is one of the reasons why a lot of people hate car dealers. Um, you know, the the, re the reason why um, you know companies like Tesla and and for, for that matter, other other automakers are in many places not allowed to sell uh, vehicles directly to consumers. They have to go through franchised car dealers is because over the last century as the, the franchise car dealer system has, has grown, those car dealers have gotten fairly wealthy and they have purchased influence with their local and state legislators uh, who in turn have passed laws that are, protect them from competition. Um, and this is an example of that. Car dealers are not crazy about the idea of over the air updates because they want people to bring their vehicle into the dealership when the car needs a software update, you know, whether it's to, for a warranty problem to fix, fix a problem or to add a new feature. Um, they would rather come in and, and have, the, have the customer come in and have their technicians do that update um, so that then they can charge back to the manufacturer you know, for that warranty service. Um, and with over-the-air updates, they don't get that opportunity. So they're, they're losing out on a potential revenue stream. And hence, so they are pursuing, they're, they're um, donating to the campaigns of their favorite legislators uh, to get laws passed that will protect, protect their business. Now, I would assume that the federal government would, might step in here or have regulations that uh, would prevent this from happening because uh, West Virginia, I gather, is the, is the first state to try to do it. Is that the case or is this maybe a, a trend that we're going to see in other states? Um, I think it is a trend we'll probably see in other states, um, unfortunately. But uh, there's not really much that the federal government can do for the most part because most car dealers are local businesses. They're not, uh, it's not interstate commerce. So the federal government here in the U.S. can regulate interstate commerce, uh, but not necessarily businesses at a local level. That, that is the purview of state governments. And so I don't, unless, unless the um, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uh, passes a regulation requiring manufacturers to provide over-the-air update capability as a safety regulation as part of the federal motor vehicle safety standards, um, then there, I don't think that there's much that the federal government can do in this case. Well, Sam, thank I always appreciate your in insights. Thank you very much for this. My pleasure, uh, Markham. Have a great day.